Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a successful <laughs> lunch break, although very express, but uh, yeah. we're happy to, to be continue with the event. So I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker. So he's Valerio Tomarchio. He's a te technical officer of Fusion for Energy. He's located in Germany. And uh, I think the topic, topic of his presentation is going to be also about JT60 and the and the how is the developments there so valerio thank you for joining us and the floor is yours thank you thank you thank you for having me actually it's a very nice opportunity to have to talk to young engineers young physicists i am a, an old school nuclear engineer by education so when i started still uh, in fission power plants were uh, uh, let's say the standard source of nuclear power then as I was still at the university, fusion became more and more uh, interesting for the scientific community. And now, as we can see, very much more also for the possible near-term uh, way of producing electrical power. So that's a little bit of me. I've been uh, working with uh, F4E for 15 years now, and I follow the procurement and the manufacturing, testing, installation of several components for JD6, you say. And today, um, I'm very happy to give you this overview of the machine and a little bit what we are doing now and what is the outlook, let's say, on the future activities where I hope many of the students present today will have the possibility and the interest to, to participate. So now I will um, test my IT skills in sharing the screen. And you should be seeing my slides in full screen now. Yes, we are. Yeah. Very good. So the title of today is uh, J60, of course, project status, but also lesson learned. I think it's a good opportunity now that we are talking with the young scientists and engineers that we really have a look at what are the initial plans of building such large experiments and then how one has to face reality and and see how some uh, issues may arise and most importantly, how to challenge them and, and, and solve them in, a, in an efficient way. So this is the lesson learned, so to say, part. So uh, I will now uh, magically transform my pointer in a, in a red dot and go to the outlook. So we will look at the machine, some of the challenges associated with manufacturing. I will focus on some particularly nasty uh, components and then in more recent times, what is commissioning of such an experiment? You will see a series of activities where a lot of people can be involved with all their skill sets. I will very briefly mention the first plasma as it was in the news everywhere and also the colleagues before have been mentioning it. And then maybe uh, even more interesting for you, uh, outlook enhancements. What are we going to do with the machine? Where the involvement will be at the most in the, uh, let's say, uh, short and medium term? Good, machine overview. Uh, this beautiful picture that you see on screen, ah, be prepared, I have a lot of hardware pictures, so I'm hoping, that, I'm hoping that the engineers will rejoice as well as the scientists, the physicists. I will show you many pictures of the actual hardware that we have installed in the machine. This one is a very nice uh, bird's view um, of the full JD6 SA tokamak. I used to say previously, JD6 SA is the largest superconducting tokamak actually being built. Now I have to change a little bit my tenses because it has been built and is now being operated. So it's the largest superconducting tokamak around. Of course, until it would be uh, active. So it's a quite important platform for research. You see here a very, a quite crowded hall. It's not yet full to the brim as it will be uh, in the near future. You see the main machine here, this kind of giant cylindrical vessel, several valve boxes, many ports heating systems. We will see a bit of that in detail uh, during the slides. This is a very recent picture, let's say, of the machine, as you could see right now. Uh, JD6 SA has been uh, born from, uh, the, let's say from uh, the idea of providing ether with a satellite tokamak. So uh, for this, the broader approach agreement has been signed between Europe and Japan. And we have started to design a few years ago now, uh, we started in 2007, 8 we started designing this satellite tokamak, which could be a stepping stone between the actual, uh, let's say, existing tokamak at the time and, and ITER. And also, 
as well as a learning platform for engineering, but also for uh, physicists and, and machine operators you know, for the future exploitation of ITER. So it has, of course, the, the main goal is to contribute to the early, uh, let's say, achievement of, of, of nuclear fusion as, a, as an energy source. Support for ITER, support for them as well, in particular technology, but also scenario development. And, and what I think is the most uh, uh, a noble point of the machine, we really want it to be a learning platform for, uh, for young, for the next generation. We already try to do that with several programs of traineeship that will be discussed also uh, later on. Uh, many grantees uh, through Eurofusion have been uh, working with us, so I think it's a very nice platform and, and will grow even more in this direction. Uh, you see here a very small picture we'll show you better later on. This is a comparison picture I think is quite uh, nice to see. These are the toroidal field coils, a portion of them, of JD60, compared to the same component for JET and ITER. You see JD60 is really like an intermediate step and of course it's quite relevant for ITER being a full superconductive tokamak. And also looking now at the latest data developments that we will also see, I guess, later on uh, in terms of plasma phasing components would be also quite an important uh, step towards either. Uh, here are maybe a larger picture where you can see better the dimensions. We are looking at, okay, 12 meters, the cryos at 15 meters overall. You see here many components, the PF coils, all the mechanical structures, PF coils, the central soil is inside. Of course, JD66 is a, is a conventional, let's say, classical tokamak, so it requires all a set of coils we will see later for the plasma operation. Here you can see some comparison of the superconducting devices in terms of, let's say, plasma cross-section. Uh, you see either, with, uh, sorry, JD60 will be the second largest, considering this uh, shape of ITER. While, of course, there are several other relatively smaller machines, which anyway are providing quite interesting results. And of course, sh share part of the complexity of a fully superconductive machine. Uh, in comparison, for instance, with copper machines that have been mentioned today. Um, here we see some of the physics goals. I'm not being a physicist myself, I will just uh, quickly go through them. You can see how the target of ITER and DEMO uh, will be, let's say, the closest. Uh, milestone will be the break even condition. And JD60 is a, uh, equivalent, uh, it's a break even equivalent. Uh, deuterium plasma regime will be able to, to run for extended uh, shots. So we really want to, uh, let's say, explore regimes which are very close to the ITER and DEMO relevance. Uh, also here you can see there are some of the DEMO uh, scenarios which fall into the parameter space of JD60 SA. There are several physics parameters of, of relevance and you can see here some of the plasma uh, geometrical parameters. We are looking at quite intense plasma currents. Let's say our uh, reference scenario full performance is 5.5 megaamps, uh, 2.25 uh, Tesla of toroidal field achieved through, uh, let's say, the full uh, energization of the 18 uh, superconducting TF coils, roughly three meters major radius, 1.18 minor radius. It's quite an elongated plasma, you see, quite a modern, if you want, fashionable plasma. And we will have a quite a substantial plasma volume that, of course, will allow. Uh, interesting experiments. Um, so today we first have a look at the components and uh, then we will have a look at the commissioning as I said and then the outlook on the future. Here on this slide you can see some of the uh, assembly steps of this machine. Uh, just to mention this machine has been started assembly in 2013 and we were basically finished with the, with the machine closed and ready for commissioning in 2020. So it's not a, a negligible speed, let's say, for such a, a size of machine. And yes, we had a couple of hiccups during production. Some of them we will uh, even see today. But let's say our goal was, let's say, to be there in 2019 and we managed in 2020. So all in all, being the largest machine around of this type, having been completely assembled, this, I think is quite a good uh, result. And we have been, let's say, preparing uh, and um, the field dismantling the old JD60U, which was there when we, I mean, we recycled, let's say, the building of JD60U, another record-breaking uh, Japanese tokamak. Basically, the, the, the big engineering activity started in 2007, and then, I mean, in roughly 
of six years, we were completely done in engineering and we were already assembling components. And of course, in the shadow also manufacturing some, but let's say all the whole process finished in 2020. And then we started our commissioning at that point. You see here some interesting pictures. The first, uh, the base of the machine has it been uh, installed in by then an empty uh, Togama coal. Then uh, more components have been brought, like the uh, lower colloidal coils. We have manufactured the, and installed the uh, vacuum vessel, which is very similar topologically speaking to the inner one, is a, is a double shell uh, vacuum vessel. Um, the DF coils, of course, the installation of the vacuum vessel has been quite uh, challenging to achieve very good tolerances in the positioning of the segments. This is a, an ongoing issue also for larger machines. We have installed the DF coils using a very sophisticated rotary crane and that is quite useful when you have to do with the, the symmetrically with axisymmetric devices. You see the kinds of vessel body, we see a better picture later on. This was a, an in-kind procurement from Spain, as Professor Hidalgo was saying before, uh, JD60 SA has been not just uh, an exercise in, in, in design and installation, but very much also an exercise, a successful example of international collaboration between Japan on one side, of course, and, and Europe. And you can imagine Europe is very much uh, what I would see like a, a one nation, but you know very well it's made of several nations. And so let's say in a second order, also an interesting exercise of European collaboration, if you want. Very successful. Installation of the so cryostat solenoid final top lead final assembly in 2020. So this, of course, is just summarized in 10 pictures, but there were several issues we had to face. We will see some in the next slides. Here, I want to break down for you also in support of the of explaining the the sharing of uh, of contributions. How much has been done by Japan? How much by Europe? And also some additional flags to see which European country has been doing what. The most, uh, let's say, larger scale contribution from Spain was the the, the crisis, as was mentioned. Of course, there were there will be also several others in diagnostics and other components. Uh, Italy, France, um, Belgium have been uh, working at the toilet field coils. Germany to some of the interfaces, current lease in particular. Assembly has been shared a little bit within Europe and Japan with the several uh, engineering service contracts which have been uh, uh, managed in Japan directly by us, together, of course, with the Japanese main contractors. Power supplies has been provided by Italy and France to, uh, let's say, update the existing uh, base power supplies which were available to JP60U prior to JP60SA. A huge cryogenic plant has been provided by France, which Okay, now there is the, the one of it is operational, but for a few maybe months has been the, also one of the largest around for uh, scientific applications. So quite some, quite some, uh, you know, interconnected contributions which had to reach timely uh, the installation site in Japan, and also had to be let's say harmoniously uh, let's say managed uh, on site. So that was quite an exercise. Here I have a collection of pictures for you that of course belong to the era when we were putting the machine together. Now it's quite difficult to step into the machine and take pictures. But you can see here how large is the vacuum vessel uh, internal volume. You can see here a not so short operator. I mean, this guy is 1.8 meters tall, uh, standing inside the vacuum vessel. It's, it's quite huge. Of course, here is also quite empty. And it's still quite empty during the first plasma operation. We have just a minimum you will see later equipment of uh, central column tiles and upper diverter, all inertial. We have also some poloidal limiters here, uh, all inertially cooled just to, uh, let's say, contain the first plasma. Of course, we will have a full equipment of actively cooled components uh, in the next operational phases. Um, some other beautiful shiny pictures of the thermal shield of the vacuum vessel in particular. So that layer that protects the cryogenic components from the strong radiation of the vacuum vessel. Here additional port thermal shield, middle, uh, let's say, uh, external thermal shield. We had to uh, button up all these thermal shields together with quite some accuracy. And considering they are quite flexible, I mean, if you are familiar with the with the interthermal shield, that's a, a solid, thick, uh, let's say, steel uh, uh, 
plates, while we are now looking at double walled three millimeter thick panels. So they are quite flimsy and quite flexible. It was, you see, they are all installed on, on stiffening structures. It was quite a feat to install them all in the proper, with the proper accuracy. Of course, they are very shiny to reflect the thermal radiation. The magnet system of JD60 would require a separate uh, presentation, probably, but very, uh, in, in short summary, we have 18 very slender toroidal field coils that make a toroidal magnet. We have chosen niobium titanium as the superconductor because it would fulfill the, the, let's say, magnetic field and temperature margin requirements. JD60, say, I must say, has been designed in a, let's say, uh, keeping in very much in mind the efficiency achievable manufacturing goals, a little bit keeping costs in check. I mean, it's a non-sense machine that uh, I would say has been built uh, in a rather compact time and uh, let's say can of course fulfill its, its goals by using existing technology. It was mentioned uh, just in the, one of the previous talks, I mean, the importance of so starting from a very well-known technology, and niobium titanium, of course, is very well known. Also, niobium tin nowadays, with all the ether production, etc., is a quite well-known superconducting material. We had a mix of, of superconducting materials in the various coils because we really tailored them to the magnetic field requirements. We have, of course, a central solenoid, uh, four modules individually powered, six colloidal coils for shaping equilibrium and 18 TF coils. If we look now a bit closely to the TF coils, um, uh, this has been quite an adventure. We have uh, provided the TF coils in kind from Europe, all of that. And we as uh, um, F4E have managed some of the contracts, but many more have been managed by European voluntary contributors. This is why I say a European uh, collaboration, if you want to experiment. I mean, so many European countries under the, Euro the Europe umbrella, but in practice dealing on their own passion for the project with national companies to provide the hardware. So quite impressive. We have bought the strand ourselves and also some forging materials. Then we had the Italian partners creating the conductor, creating the casing segments, two different integrators uh, integrating the the, conduct, the conductor into winding packs and then the winding packs into the casing. In parallel, in the background, outer structures, outer intercoil structures were built by French partners and also some Italian partners. Then the coil itself, so winding pack plus casing, vacuum pressure impregnated together, have been tested in a dedicated, in a facility built just for that. I will never get tired saying that operate, that testing operating condition, such magnets is of paramount importance, not because we don't believe that they are superconductive, because this we can also test in simple experiment, but just because we are still in a phase that each of these magnets, even if we build 18 of them, is like a first of a kind. And you can have issues occurring for the first time in any of the exemplars of these shorts of this small series, right? And some of these issues you only see in operating conditions. So I think where possible, where meaningful in terms of schedule, in terms of cost, but with some, uh, let's say, urgency, I would say uh, full, I mean, testing at operating conditions is of paramount importance. We did some pre-assembly in France with the outer interface structure, and then we sent everything to, to Japan in beautiful boxes. I mean, uh, rugged for a sea and even air transport, and we uh, then installed them together with the Javanese main site contract. So that was quite an adventure. Um, if you will be in the future, as I hope, involved in such large projects, you always have to strike a balance between how much you want the industry to give you a, you know, a ready to go solution, you know, uh, um, and how much instead you want to split up your uh, procurement in smaller contracts that then you have to like you know like a, like an orchestra conductor you have to director you have to uh, you know harmoniously uh, make them work together so the, we decided for the second approach which normally is more cost effective on the other end it requires quite some uh, human resources if you want to be managed to to be able to manage all these all these interfaces right 
Anyway, both approaches are, uh, let's say, possible. There are experiments which have been successful with one of them and others which are successful with another of them. I mean, at the end, it's a matter of, uh, of uh, also, uh, if you want, uh, boundary conditions. But we were fortunately free enough to distribute the work in this way and manage accordingly. Here are some, uh, again, uh, some beautiful pictures of hardware, the first of a kind uh, coils coming from the two different uh, European uh, integrators. Here you uh, work in progress pictures of the casing segments, which have been obtained from uh, fabricated uh, stainless steel plates and then machined to very high accuracy to be then able to be wrapped, if you want, and welded around the superconducting winding packs. Here, the famous test facility with the support frames, a coil hanging from the support frame inside, a thermal shield inside of this vacuum tank, a dedicated uh, helium uh, liquefier and refrigerator has been uh, attached to the facility with uh, I mean, all the valve boxes and all the accessories to be able to pump the cryogenic coolant uh, into the coil in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in an operational relevant way, of course, and then test at full current observe the behavior during a quench that we induced several times to guarantee that the coil would survive even the most, uh, let's say, abrupt event that you can have in a superconducting magnet. So, quite an experience. Here we have uh, some of the outer intercoil structures, the gravity supports, the inner intercoil structures, all terms that are related to buttering together the TF coils into a, tor into a toroidal magnet, into a, a TF magnet. <laughs> Here, the, pre the pre installation phase where we have a coil and the outer intercoil structure being, let's say, worn, being installed on the outside of the coil and then uh, finally adjusted with mechanical pads. And then this unit would be uh, bolted together and sent to Japan. Now, looking at the Japanese components, we have huge poloidal coils. I think this is, EF1 is the largest yet. No, maybe now some of either coils, of course, are larger. But for a, for a short window of time, this has been the largest superconducting pulse magnet uh, ever being built. Now I guess some of the either coils, of course, are larger. This is, I think, some some in excess of 12 meter diameters and has been built with uh, very high accuracy. Also, the smaller coils, you have two, you have three. We count them up to six. Some of them has been installed in the bottom of the machine prior to all others, very similar to what has been done with it, as we see later on. And then the last three has been installed uh, after the TF coils have been completely installed. Here you see the central solenoid in its transport cask. This object weighs in excess of 90 tons. It's made of four stacked modules, uh, an album uh, tin, so very high performance conductor. It basically creates the the, the loop voltage, the flux swing for the induction of the current in the plasma, of course, is controlled. Good, here you see a magnificent view of the cryostat of JD60 say You see here some operator to see the, the relative distance, the size. This has been pre assembled in Spain prior to shipment, just to be sure that everything was falling in the right place. Yes, and then, of course, made again in pieces and uh, let's say unbolted, not cut, unbolted and sent to, to Japan for final installation. Cryo plant, as I said, a very large uh, cryo plant, uh, cold boxes, uh, warm compressors, helium tanks. I mean, all components are quite huge. And if you will see the uh, cryo plant of either, of course, is even more huge than, <laughs> than this. But of course, the principle is very similar. And uh, helium storage, nitrogen storage, compressor building, uh, cold boxes. And then, of course, there is a long cryo line that goes into the tokamak building that is, that is here. This is a, a sort of a more conventional part of a, of a fusion plant. I mean, cryogenic plants are used in chemical oil and gas I mean, in several industries. So it's not completely science, science fiction, but we have, of course, very special, specific requirements of flow, of pressure, of, of power, if you want, uh, equivalent power at four Kelvin. So we have some very specific requirements compared to more conventional industry. We really have to work at the lowest possible temperature. To, to be able to work with them and the low temperature superconductors. <clears throat> now, I would like to go very quickly into a series of slides, uh, of slides that <clears throat> show you some of the issues that we had during manufacturing. In particular, I've been following the DF coil, so I have a lot of these dirty pictures. 
of manufacturing horrors. So I will show you some of them that you might you know, keep in mind in your future career. And also I will give you my two cents of advice at the end. What you see here is, a, you have no idea what it is, is an insulated uh, piece of helium piping with some black paint, it's a conductive paint. And you see here some very small scorch mark. Now, this was a, a fault to ground in an insulation made on helium pipes. This was very difficult to find, it was in a TF coil. This is to say that high voltage insulation for cryogenic application is still a very, you know, specialized job that not many companies can do. And there is not that much of uh, state of the art. I mean, almost every project need to find the best solution for its own needs. And qualification trials, mock-ups are vital to, to the success. I mean, this was due to an unforeseen uh, combination of several uh, geometrical features that finally burned through the uh, glass epoxy insulation. So high voltage insulation, very important. You see here an evolution of the same type of defect from instrumentation wires crossing the insulation layers and then having some, again, voltage holding issues. Instrumentation wires are vital for a, well, not just, I was saying for a scientific experiment, but for any, even for the power plants, of course, are basically those wires that allow you to read the physical properties or quantities of your components. In particular, these instrumentation wires were there to measure voltage. So you need to patch the high voltage part of your coil, but to do that, you have to go necessarily through the insulation layers. Now, this passage is in practical terms, a minor detail of a coil, but in, in, in terms of, you know, life of a machine can be a critical issue. So as usual, the devil is in the details. Again, here, something as simple as extending these instrumentation wires was requiring quite some development because you shall not have ever any uh, discharge in a, in a, in particular, in a toroidal field magnet, but also in the boiler coils. And so we had to develop some special techniques for that. So even for the simplest thing, you have to invest quite some knowledge, some, some efforts. Here again, some geometrical details that have created a breakage in the uh, epoxy glass insulation. Again, high voltage insulation is very critical. Now we move into the realm of metallurgy and uh, uh, the good uh, choice of the metallurgical processes in your material. This is a beautiful uh, microscopy picture of a cross section of a brittle uh, of a part of a large forging that we wanted initially to use for the casings of the TF coils. These white dots are very brittle phases that we don't want them to be there. And we realized there were some issues with the, with the forging process of this material. So really, at the very beginning of the manufacturing chain, something can then evolve to an issue that then makes your machine, that jeopardizes your machine. So it's the famous butterfly wing creating a tornado on the other side of the planet. I mean, everything needs to be kept in mind during the full manufacturing process. Again, this one is something that we saw on some uh, components. These are embedded well defects that are harmless if they remain embedded, but become critical if they surface because they create an open uh, crack for the fatigue uh, to be then uh, taken advantage of. We discover them as we machine the components. So when you buy the raw material, they are allegedly good because the defects are not visible. Then you start machining them, they appear, and then whose responsibility is that? So when you decide your chain of management and responsibilities, think about uh, issues like that. This is just now a series of pictures about bad craftsmanship. This instrumentation wire exit has been worked very badly. I mean, it should definitely not look like that with all the scratches and then the, and the deep cuts and the unfinished work of removing wires. Um, this and the next few slides will tell you that uh, on-site inspection is paramount. You always have to have eyes on the components that you build and must be your eyes or eyes of a person that is very close to you. Um, not just because the companies might want to take advantage of you, but just because some companies might not have the full picture of the machine. So, and it's very difficult to transfer this full picture of the machine to a manufacturing company that wants to get the job done and be paid. So you necessarily need 
on-site inspection of all the critical processes. And this also is one of my favorite. I mean, when you don't look, I mean, the moment you look somewhere else, then the, the odd operator just puts some garbage in your component, and then you have to explain that to your customers in Japan. Anyway, this is a minor thing. It's just funny to see that. And also, I'm a bit concerned about the health of the operators eating such high calorie snacks. I mean, maybe I would have preferred some apple peelings. Anyway, this is another uh, two, uh, you know, uh, overzealous uh, uh, operator cutting very deep inside an insulation layer. Of course, this should not have happened. Again, if we had eyes there, we could have seen and could have uh, uh, explained to the overzealous operator that we would prefer our, our insulation to stay at full thickness. Anyway, that was not a big deal, but sometimes it must be you saying it's not a big deal and not the company that says, okay, this is nothing, let's ship the components. So eyes on the manufacturing. Also this one, a nice view of the inside of a component which was supposed to go like this in vacuum, in a cryogenic vacuum. Can you imagine? I mean, that was full of oil and so forth. Oil was even dripping from holes. This is because the company had no idea that the component was going to be installed in vacuum and so they used just the conventional machine tools machine fluids and very poor let's say inspection and cleaning so always make the companies very careful about the final application of your products and then this doesn't say anything to you but these are the gravity supports of a component that was held in a machining shop which then suddenly fell from the crane with all the machining rig and got bent very badly. This is nobody's fault, probably just uh, this guy is an accident. Fortunately, nobody got uh, hurt, which is, of course, the most important thing. But again, uh, sometimes rigging and lifting operations seems to be trivial, but can be quite uh, consequential in a, in a large project. This again, a small crack in a, at the root of a weld. Again, this was a, a, mis, a misinterpretation of requirements with the supplier. We had to fix that on some components which were already built in the Tokamak because we discovered as the production was going on and we were manufacturing and sending to Japan at the same time. So eyes on the part always. This is a, a deep cave inside the massive component that we made to fix a deep defect, a deep welding defect. Welding of high thickness stainless steel is all but simple. And, uh, and uh, you know, our design choices for superconducting magnets are very limited. So we basically need to go to stainless steel and uh, sometimes the defect can be uh, tricky and you have to spend, we spent 10 days to fix all of these defects in the workshop. This is an example of, of generosity. I will not say the national of the company that was so generous with these metrology targets. They were three times as large as they were supposed to be. So they thought they made us a gift, like I will give you very large metrology targets. In fact, they were colliding with a structure going very close and would have made impossible the operation of the tokamak. So imagine this is a 12 centimeter disc jeopardizing the operation of hundreds of million worth of tokamak. So sometimes the details are killing you. Uh, we had again to go into the tokamak and fix it up. I mean, I spent a few years of my career just fixing up problems, including this one. There is a beautiful wallpaper for your desktop, but at the same time is the map of how much material we had to remove from the toroidal field magnet to allow the smooth insertion of the central solenoid. That was a little bit, let's say, overweight, over, let's say, uh, over dimension. Yes. Anyway, again, this was a, now I'm joking, but that was a long effort of metrology, of engineering, of uh, uh, field engineering in particular, installing uh, machines inside an already built tokamak. So quite the emotion. Here are my two cents that I hope you will treasure. Uh, think ahead about manufacturing a bit of your design. I mean, it's something that I have also heard from other colleagues. I mean, when you, when you design a machine, from the very beginning, so think if you can ever build that with existing technology or with minor improvement over existing technology. We did that for JD60 and I think we were quite successful in manufacturing things. Then of course, these little details have been uh, bugging us. Uh, in, for, in fact, also specifications are quite important. I mean, your taking a specification must be to the point. Um, quality, man sorry, quality management system. 
is a quite uh, a modern introduction into into scientific projects. I mean, a few decades ago, uh, tokamaks were built like, uh, I mean, with uh, much more relaxed uh, quality management systems. Nowadays, we try to take as much as possible from uh, best practices of private companies to have a solid, robust quality management system. Making prototype, here I say coils, but prototype of everything, if possible, should be always be done because so many things you learn when you do the thing the first time and uh, it's better to learn that on a prototype that maybe in the end will become a beautiful stage in front of your institute rather than on the first of a kind. Cold testing, full current testing for a coil is a definitive test. Metrology is key to success. I mean I always say measure twice, cut once. I mean all you DIY enthusiasts know this, this figure of speech. I mean metrology is a key to success. Always have uh, clear in mind the shape of your components. We did a lot of metrology for JD60. I was also in WSNX many years ago. We did the enormous amount of metrology there because of the complex shapes. And then uh, eyes on the manufacturing always and brace for impact. I mean, have uh, a plan B ready in case something would uh, definitely go south. Tools, repairs, engineering contracts. Okay. I hope you will, I mean, you're all very young, so uh, I mean, I hope you will treasure this information and maybe they, one day you will think about me when you will carry out your job. Now, commissioning activities, this is quite interesting because it's actually being carried out. This was our original plan. Look how we were enthusiastic um, with a very compact and uh, full of uh, uh, activities uh, commissioning plan. Of course, we have to pump down the machine, leak check, we don't want any foreign material to contaminate your plasma. Several, uh, um, let's say, uh, superconductive activities, uh, in particular cool down, so make the machine ready to be uh, in the superconductive state. Baking, it's very important to prepare all the vacuum surfaces inside the vacuum vessel, and then several coil energizing tests. We energize the coils one by one. Uh, we see if everything goes okay, if the power supplies are talking to each other very well. Then plasma operation, once the power supplies are fine and the current in the coil can be fed all right, then we start doing scenarios. So we inject a little bit of, of gas, we ionize with some EC assistance, and then we, in, we induce current with the discharge of the solenoid. This is what we all want to see. Well, and that was our original plan. I say our original plan because finally it didn't went exactly how we wanted. Anyway, we did some activities, but we were immediately uh, facing some issues which were present or visible only as the machine was operational. In particular, high voltage insulation problems, as I told you, high voltage insulation is, uh, is the black devil of uh, superconducting machines. Not all the systems have been, uh, operate, have been tested in operating conditions and many of the joints between uh, coils were never tested in operating conditions because we, they were field joint, so joint on the field in the machine without any possible testing, of course, at room temperature. So in some of these details, we found some, uh, some poor insulation. We had some breakthroughs, some burn throughs we had to repair quite a few things. We also had low voltage insulation, you know, all this axis metric machine. We don't want the solenoid to induce current in anything but the plasma. So all the rest, all the metallic structures must, must be insulated uh, each sector. And we have found some small short circuits that finally we have, uh, uh, we have fixed in both the TF coils and the thermal shields. The problem is, as we were fixing that, we were, of course, doing low voltage tests. Low voltage means 500 volts. Now, for your uh, knowledge, 500 volts are perfectly enough to fry your temperature sensors. And we fried quite a lot of them in doing the low voltage insulation tests. So we had to operate, we are still operating the machine with just a, I mean, with few sensors non-operational. Fortunately, the critical ones are still operational, but some of the surface sensors that we wanted to have a more uh, detailed uh, understanding of the temperature of the components, they are gone for good. And we have to, sub to replace them in the next, uh, let's say, maintenance phase. We had uh, some of the pyro breakers. Pyro breakers are very critical components. They are used to section the uh, circuit, the current circuit immediately in case something goes south. And so they, to be sure of operation, they are based on an explosive charge that really guillotine your electrical contacts. 
well, some of them were not working in the sense that the explosive charge was misfiring. We route the cause to a water leak or water absorption problem, so we had to do some investigation there. And also electrical noise has been one of the issues. And you know, you never see these things before the machine is put together. Because the, you only have noise from other components when they are in the same room. If you do factor acceptance tests of a power supply, they will not experience there the noise that you will have in the dogmatic. So be prepared for that for, a, for every machine. Pumping and, and cool down was rather smooth. Of course, we were very cautious the first time. It took quite a while to uh, do the pumping and to start the cool down. But finally, this is the successful uh, superconductive transition of the TF coils. And you see that with a fast drop of voltage uh, to zero at the terminals of the coils. We were measuring that with a small current being always on. And we managed to reach our terminal vacuum, let's say of 10 to the minus six, uh, 10 to the minus five in the vacuum vessel, in the cryostatic vacuum vessel. Uh, of course, um, we had a few issues with the warm compressors, but nothing too serious. Here you can see a cool down curve. So the inlet temperature of the helium going to the coil systems. It took a couple of, of months <clears throat> from October, let's say early October to late November to get there with some stops here and there a little bit because we wanted to see the situation how it was a little bit because there were some maintenance slots that were uh, in between. Anyway, we managed, we were quite happy. We also monitored the displacement of some coils to follow, not their shrinkage to cryogenic temperature. We made several current tests. You see here a, a small energization of one of the poloidal coils. We tested all of them at increasingly high currents, one kilowatts, three kilowatts, with different also uh, power supply systems, base power supplies, uh, QPC, and so on. Uh, we had done a several uh, control quench tests. I mean, this is quite important to do quench tests. I mean, to be sure that the coil can take a quench without burning, without becoming inoperative because of damaging of the superconducting material. We also had a, a few hiccups uh, with the power supplies, yes, from hardware or firmware, mostly firmware problems. In the cryo plants, I mean, the cryo plant, you see here a schematic, even if it's a commercial product, as I said, the, it's, the application is very specific. So we have very specific items in this power, in this cryo plant, and very specific operational sequences, which need to be tuned to perfection. And you can only do that when you are there. We have done long uh, months of commissioning just of the, of the cryo plant, and still we had the occasional leak up with trips of turbines, trips of compressors, but nothing too serious. It's still working today very well. Uh, so it's quite a robust uh, piece of engineering. On the 2nd of March, 2021, we were super happy. We were uh, fully energizing the TF coils. 25.7 kiloamps, long plateau, everything was very nice. We even uh, tried to do some uh, EC assisted plasma, uh, uh, which was actually successful. We also tried the low discharge cleaning. Um, so we were quite satisfied until the 2nd of March, 2021. Then we had to stop transmissions for a few years because of this guy. You might remember uh, I was talking about instrumentation wires and crossing of uh, electrical insulation. We had indeed a major fault. We had uh, a short circuit between terminals of a boiler coil bridged by this, uh, you know, placed by God, uh, massive piece of steel between the two terminals. Uh, okay, the coil was made inoperative because the joint got a serious uh, helium leak, uh, the instrumentation wires were broken, there was a clear path to ground, so we had to warm up the machine and fix it up. We fixed it up by identifying first the root cause, the wire was going too quickly from outside to inside, you actually need a very long uh, tracking length, it's called, inside the, the insulation layer, so that the discharge that we had, the arc discharge, would not initiate because the few molecules available there of rarefied gas in the cryogenic vacuum uh, don't manage to knock themselves off in an avalanche. They will, I mean, the discharge will be quenched. You have that in very high density, like room temperature atmosphere, and you have that in perfect vacuum, that you don't have enough molecules. But in, in intermediate conditions of vacuum that you can always have because of some 
a small release of gas, you will have dispersion conditions where a discharge is theoretically possible. So we had to source the problem, fix it up, several repair process, all qualified independently in several parts of the world, in Europe, in Japan, several local tests, uh, and also in part of the machines far away from the terminals, also mid joint feeder uh, joints, terminal um, current leads. So we fixed quite a lot of these areas, but still, I mean, we could not fix all the locations because some areas are not accessible. So we had to uh, take a decision and we had to mitigate the risk of continuing the commissioning. And we did that with, uh, with three actions. So we have reinforced our possible insulation. We have uh, adjusted our power supplies to limit the voltage application to the coils. And we have uh, installed a very precise vacuum monitoring system to avoid passion conditions as much as possible. Here you can see some of the repairs that we have implemented also in areas which were not showing any defect, but which could be candidates of a possible defect. And of course, we had to qualify all of them on a bench. So we had carried out many months of uh, qualification and in parallel repair of the machine. We have improved the power supply with a very simple uh, uh, changing of the grounding scheme, which have in one go halved the voltage level to the coils but also installing active components like baristors to keep in check the voltage in the coils during fast transit events. <clears throat> and we have installed a very simple filters. I mean, just to filter out the ripple of some of the power supplies, which were of the old generation, were quite uh, full of ripple. Of course, with copper coils, no problem. With the superconductive coils, with all this insulation in cryogenic conditions, it's quite an issue. So now our signals are much smoother than before. And we also have installed this pressure monitoring system made with uh, custom made uh, panning gauges and some uh, sentinel wires to give us an idea whether there is uh, the incoming uh, of a passion condition prior to energization or during energization. We also tested them in operating conditions and they react quite quickly uh, after a, an intentional gas injection event. Good. So we pulled the machine again. This time we were quite faster, we had much less hiccups, we were down in, in less than two months, we had all our superconductive transition to all the coil systems, so that was quite successful in July this year. So, and then we started really playing with the machine, we did uh, quite some low discharge cleaning, uh, we did uh, some, uh, we will see in a moment. RF plasmas, the glow discharge cleaning is there, you know, to knock off all the contaminants instead of your vacuum vessel. So it's quite useful to do that, to reach an optimum cleanliness of your vacuum inside the vacuum vessel. Also baking up to 200 Celsius, of course, is helping in that. Uh, so we did some uh, easy plasmas, as I said, just to make, not just to make beautiful pictures, but really to test all the systems involved and link all of them. Um, and then finally, we also did some combination tests where all the coils have been animated with the waveforms that would imitate a plasma scenario when the machine is operational. And finally, first plasma. Yes, we did it. It was on the news. I'm not allowed to tell you very much, unfortunately, but just to tell you it's a real tokamak plasma, of course. Uh, we started uh, slow. We are now doing some, uh, let's say, simple experiments to get more familiar with the controls. And just in doing that, the, the plasma current that we can reach has been multiplied uh, fivefold. Uh, on the 1st of December, we will have the official ceremony where this beautiful uh, plasma discharges and plasma glows will be broadcasted to the world. And of course, we keep our monitoring, our pressure monitoring online just to protect the machine from unwanted, uh, let's say, discharges. Now, maybe most interesting for you, the outlook in these few minutes that they are available. Uh, we, are, uh, we are here. In, okay, we were supposed to be, uh, um, we are here. This is the, the second integrated commissioning the, and the first plasma operation. Um, then immediately after that, let's say from the half of December, we will start a maintenance and enhancement phase in which we will equip the machine with many more components, in particular diagnostic systems, um, uh, in plasma phasing components. So this will make the, the will bring the machine to an young adulthood, let's say from this initial childhood, 
where more significant plasmas can be, uh, can be done in the operational phase two. We can already start operation in, in deuterium, for instance. <clears throat> we will have an inertially cooled lower diverter. We will have a much increased maximum power availability, so we can make some more reliable and interesting plasma. Um, I will show you now the transformation that we expect. So from this minor equipment in the wagon vessel to full uh, graphite uh, plasma facing components, stabilizing plates, upper diverter, lower diverter, made in cassettes with the remote handling capabilities, massive gas injection, diverter cryovalves, several plasma control coils, and of course, a new network of water pipes for cooling even if inertially this plasma facing components. We have some of them already built, waiting to be installed, cassette frames, stabilizing plates, um, heat sinks. We have several new power supplies that will be needed for the uh, plasma control coils, uh, heating systems like gyrotrons, several diagnostic uh, systems, uh, heating systems. We have uh, commissioned all the positive ion sources. JD6 is quite famous for its capability of, of MBI heating, and also here some noise cancelling coils for the MBIs. Uh, Europe is providing some uh, uh, very high technology pellet injection systems for the fueling of the machine. Uh, was mentioned before uh, the, the field diagnostics uh, being uh, provided by Spain, also the MGI already provided and shipped by Germany, by Max Planck. The inverter cryobumps are already there and will be I mean, prepared for installation very soon. Um, the inverter spectrometers are being provided in, in Europe, and there is a lot of working on that. I mean, several groups are working on, on, on various activities, Thomson scattering, ECRF components. So there is quite a lot of activities going on in several institutions, and, and of course, they could be for you a nice application for following, let's say, the, the last steps of manufacturing, but also for following the installation in the machine in Japan. This is a very brief summary of the operational phase two after we will be doing the, the first maintenance, reaching the final nominal current, um, also studying transition to H mode, mitigation of disruptions, so all thematics that are very critical for ITER. As I said, we want to be a, a stepping stone and also a learning platform for ITER and also scenario development, of course. Then in the, let's say, medium-long term, uh, operation three and following, we will have uh, additional maintenance phases. We will install additional components, not last an actively cool carbon diverter. So this will allow us to make very long shots. So it's no more inertial, so we are limited in time, but we can go really to the nominal scenarios that go from 100 to 300 seconds, plus, of course, all possible uh, extra long scenarios at, at uh, moderate current. We will be definitely working in deuterium. We will be actively working on re remote handling that finally will be used in the, uh, let's say, far phases uh, after the, let's say, 27, 28. And also our heating power will be almost complete. You see here a picture of the actively cooled diverter. We are already building uh, prototypes and testing them. Uh, here you can see a view of the full uh, MBI systems uh, ECRF, ECRF system, all the commissioning that we have been doing, all the final uh, powers with the uh, frequencies. We have a multi-frequency gyrotrons for, for our purposes and several neutral beam uh, launchers. And yes, and this is the final view on the full uh, equipment, the full complement of diagnostics that will be in this machine. JD60 SA is a real um, scientific machine, so diagnostics is of paramount importance to study uh, the plasma performance, and so they should be equipped um, appropriately. Good. I managed with five minutes spare. Sorry, Dario, it was a little bit long, but I mean, I just hope I have, you know, waken, woken up the interest of the students on this project, and of course, please, any questions as well. Valerio, thank you very much for this, like you mentioned, very graphic presentation. Yes, so I think yes. was, pictures, pictures. Yeah, I think it was really useful because you you brought up a topic uh, that should not be under mentioned. That is, uh, yeah, the challenges for assembly yes. and manufacturing because Absolutely. the previous speakers, of course, we have discussed about research and and, yes. and modeling activities and plasma control and materials and everything. 
But now this is a part of uh, of fusion, let's say an era of fusion where we're building the machines themselves. And that brings new challenges, which are mm -hmm. assembly and manufacturing. And also like you, yeah, like you saw, like you show in the timeline, these, these, these challenges really can affect the delivery of, of, of uh, machines and timeline and they mm -hmm. shift and it's really important. Mm -hmm. So, so it's uh, very nice that you bring up these, these topics along with the view of JT60, which is a, uh, uh, a device that's going to be inaugurated, I think, next month, early December, I think is the official. Yes, the first of December. Yeah. Yes, the first of December, we do the. Please, Minister, push this button event where, uh, let's say, politicians and important representatives of the European Commission and the Japanese Minister of uh, Ministry of uh, Education and Research can witness, let's say, the the goals achieved so far with the machine. That is, in fact. A, a substantial first plasma. I mean, so far we have been playing with the machine, mostly getting familiar with the controls and the and the and the, the control of the plasma itself, so that we can make a proper, uh, let's say, uh, you know, um, presentation to our uh, most important sponsors and stakeholders. Yes, it will be the first of December, so just a few days from now. And then I think once we will be uh, completely public, there will be a, a shower of. Uh, scientific results coming in the next few days where the physicists will have, let's say, free ground to experiment even more with the machine. And then uh, we will go to this long maintenance phase where we, let's say, grow up the machine into their uh, into its adulthood. That's great. That's great. So we're going to start with the first question. Benjamin, yes, you can uh, please state your question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you for your presentation. It was yeah. really interesting. And uh, I want to ask you um, kind of an overview because I'm a physicist. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, to I want to study more about uh, uh, fusion energy. Uh, but the fact is, I mean, you showed us all these technical issues and all this maintenance that has to be done. I mean, I wanted to ask uh, how is such a big collaboration work? I mean, yeah, someone finds an error and then there is a specific group of people that tries to fix it. Or it's, uh, I mean, everyone that works there has to be aware of the issues uh, before going on. So kind yes, of yes. a formation uh, uh, problem. And then yes. uh, if you're more into the research part, how important is to know exactly, I mean, because the, the machine is huge, so knowing exactly everything. But I mean, how uh, important is in research to be aware of these kind of issues and how to trying to tackle the, these kind of problems would be interesting. Thank you. Yes, yes. I mean, your first question is mostly about governance and how we talk and, and work together. I mean, we have been under a very strong lead since the very beginning of, uh, let's say, both the European uh, Office of uh, Fusion for Energy, which uh, the broader approach department and uh, the corresponding, let's say, QST department for the J60 SA machine. Uh, that was probably a little bit more than just, uh, a, a, you know, a, a professional relationship. I mean, the people were really very well familiar with each other, have been worked together long. But notwithstanding this quite important, uh, let's say, background, the condition, then all the other people were new to the project. And we just grow into an atmosphere of uh, collaboration and openness that is very fundamental. So basically, we were... Uh, 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 sharing the progress of all the activities with the technical meetings that were every three months and all the issues were uh, openly discussed and uh, sometimes we helped uh, uh, you know the Japanese colleagues in fixing some Japanese components and some other time uh, well uh, we have uh, somehow collaborated for some of our issues but I mean there was not like a task force for fixing all the all the issues uh, coming up. It was mostly uh, discussing uh, what can we quickly implement, especially when the issue was in Japan already of a European component, then this was quite uh, intense. I mean, I had to travel several times for extended period of time to, to really put my hands and, 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 you know, and coordinate repair activities there. But the point is that it is the really the, the 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 basic condition is complete uh, uh, transparency and uh, and uh, and uh, frequent uh, let's say updates of the of the two parties. But I wouldn't say it was stiff as we just talked during the technical meetings. I mean, it was really a, a daily a daily exchange with the key person of the various 
components. I mean, when we were installing the DF coils beside, that we provided from Europe, beside that I was there quite some time, but we were daily, uh, continuously exchanging with the Japanese counterparts. So it was really like being in a single uh, team. You know? In fact, we have also this integrated project team, as we call it. So where basically all people are in the same group and at that time, there were not these fantastic tools that we have now, like Zoom, like MS Teams and whatnot. I mean, we had to do, you know, the old fashioned video conference with this, you know, prehistorical systems. And still, we were quite good at that. And now, of course, it's much easier. I mean, we have a very frequent exchange every morning, actually every night at midnight, I receive the invitation to a meeting of the commissioning of the machine in Japan. And from very early morning, we start, uh, you know, video conferencing with the people in the power supply room, in the control room. I mean, now with all these tools that we have uh, developed so fast because of the pandemic, it's really much easier to be like in the same room with these people, with the colleagues in, on the other part of the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer, Valerio. Uh, we had another question in the chat, but Eva Belonoi, our next speaker, already answered so thank you for that thank so with you, this you. we yes. thank you Valerio, so much for for being present at this event uh, we will yeah. probably be in touch when we discuss student mobility towards jt60 and from jt60 so <laughs> if any question come back to me anytime thank you so much and thank you so much for being here Valerio. anytime thank you for having me so